Muy buenas tardes. Sean todos bienvenidos a la sexta y última plenaria de The Independent Learning Association Conference 2021. Agradecemos su presencia y cedo la palabra a la maestra Adelia Peña Clavel, que fungirá como moderadora en esta plenaria. Adelante. Muchas gracias, Laura. Buenas tardes, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Antes de iniciar esta última plenaria, comparto con ustedes información importante para que nos acompañen en esta sala de Zoom Webinar. La plenaria tiene una duración de 45 minutos y se cuentan con 15 minutos para preguntas. Atentamente, les solicitamos, compartan sus opiniones y escriban sus preguntas para la doctora Lourdes Ortega en inglés o en español en el espacio correspondiente. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, es para mí un honor presentar a la doctora Lourdes Ortega, quien dictará la plenaria Supporting Agency Language Learning and Teaching in the 21st Century. Lourdes Ortega is a professor in the Department of Linguistics at Georgetown, and she's also a founding member and faculty director of the Initiative of Multilingual Studies. She is best known for an award-winning meta-analysis of second language instruction published in 2000, a bestseller graduate level textbook understanding second language acquisition which was translated into Mandarin in 2016. And since 2010, for championing a bilingual and social justice turn in her field of second language acquisition. Recent articles have appeared in Calico Journal, World English's Modern Language Journal, and The Language Learning, her latest book in the Cambridge Handbook of Bilingualism, co-edited in, in 2019. She is in the general editor of Language Learning. Originally from Southern Spain, Lourdes lived and worked as a language teacher in Greece for most of her 20s. So Dr. Ortega, thank you very much for being here. Gracias por estar aquí. You are most welcome and the floor is yours. Muchas gracias Adelia por la introducción y por tenerme aquí como uh, en, en el Congreso. Y voy a, uh, I'm going to share my screen and choose my PowerPoint. And then I'm going to choose uh, the presenter mode. And I hope that now everything looks okay and that everyone can hear me. Is that right? Can I check, Adelia? Yes. Yes. Thank you, thank you very much. So again, thank you very much for having me here at the Congress. And I am very grateful to Adelia Peña Clavel for inviting me um, and to all the team. Um, I know they've worked really, really hard for this conference, uh, and uh, they are very excited that we're all here together talking about language learning and teaching and autonomous and independent learning. Um, let me start by uh, reflecting on why teaching and learning English today may be important. Of course, globalization provides a strong justification for English language learning today. Um, because we all know that English gives a com competitive edge in global markets. This may not be the same for all other languages, but in general, multilingualism does give a competitive edge. Uh, the learning of English, as the learning of any other language, can also be transformative. It can enhance mobility, it can open doors, it can transform lives, and it can be horizon opening, mind broadening. But there are also dangers, especially when the, the, the language that we teach and we learn is English. English has been called the killer language by some uh, researchers. And uh, should we then worry if we are promoting English and teaching and learning English? Well, the good thing is that the world is multilingual and has always been. Um, do the math if you think that we have about 193 countries, but more than 7,000 languages. Take Mexico as an example. Uh, the Mexican government recognizes 68 indigenous languages and linguists count 282 indigenous languages in Mexico. So the world is multilingual, has always been. And if we think about it in this way, teaching English and the English fever that we have today in the world just makes people more multilingual. Uh, because when we think of second language English speakers, uh, what we should be thinking of is English knowing multilinguals. By definition, someone who is adding English becomes a multilingual. Um, of course, this depends on your definition of multilingual. So I want to clarify that I do not mean being bilingual or multilingual from birth. So growing up in a family where the languages, both languages or several languages are available. 
I also do not mean that people who can consider themselves bilingual or multilingual should be native-like or should be able to pass for a native speaker. I don't even mean that all the languages that we speak and use should be at equal perfect proficiency. All I mean is when we are functionally able to use more than one language for our own purposes in life, then we are bilingual or multilingual. So how do we teach English or any other language while supporting our students to be empowered multilinguals? And what does agentive learning, which is uh, the keyword in my title, what does agentive learning have to do with it? I am going to be talking about the kind of agentive learning where we think of autonomy and agency. And so let me define them. Autonomy is the ability to make decisions and have a say in the direction of our lives. This is a general definition. If we think of language learning and teaching, autonomy would be the ability to make decisions and have a say in the direction of our language learning. And agency can be understood as the ability to change our place in the world despite well-known structural constraints. What are those kinds of structural constraints I have in mind? Well, one is what languages we speak and how we speak them but also our, our race and ethnicity, our class and occupation and wealth, uh, religion, gender, age, sexual orientation, and many other uh, social categories can become sources of structural constraint that constrain our place in the world. And so when agency then is applied to language teaching and learning, then we can understand it as the ability to change our place in the project of language learning despite known structural constraints. So in my talk, I will be making three recommendations. One uh, is about balancing form with meaning. The other one has to do with rethinking the roles of authentic materials and native speakers. And the third recommendation is about boosting motivation. But for all three topics, I will be thinking about agentive learning in the sense of autonomy and agency. And so autonomy is a little bit more psychological, a little bit more resting with the individual, and agency is a little bit more social, resting with the structural conditions in our social world. So let me start with recommendation number one, balancing form and meaning, but for agency and autonomy. Since the 2000s, we have had a clear emphasis on communication, and a rejection of decontextualized grammar. I think most places that teach and learn languages do assume communication should be part of how we do things and de decontextualized grammar teaching should be avoided. Um, we do know as professionals that we can teach grammar and we can teach it well if we balance form with meaning. Uh, this has been known ever since the beginning of the 90s with the notion of focus on form that Michael Long proposed at that time. And um, uh, Adelia mentioned in her introduction that uh, in 2000, I published a meta-analysis of the effectiveness of instruction. Uh, so teaching grammar and how effective it is. And we did find, my co-author John Norris and I found that Teaching grammar does lead to robust learning, at least as shown on the tests that the students take about grammar, and that explicit teaching of grammar instead of implicit leads to even better results, again, on the tests of grammar that these studies typically gave. And we do have very many seminar researchers who have devoted their careers to talking and investigating how form-focused instruction can proceed best and what, what a good balance of communication with grammar might be like. I wanted to just bring up an example here from Andujar in Spain with English uh, as a foreign language uh, students. And he used um, texting, a chat activity, or I think it was a WhatsApp activity. So he had 40 Spanish um, English as a foreign language students in Spain doing WhatsApp a WhatsApp assignment a daily question posted by a different student each day. This lasted for six months. And he also had a control group of students, 40 students who did not do this WhatsApp activity. So here's an example of what the students ex exchanged. So Magda, one of the students says, I used to play volleyball at Mondays and Wednesdays. 
And Anna, another student says, do you mean you usually play on Monday and Wednesday? Marta responds, yes, haha, ha, I'm always confused with usually. So Marta is confused actually thinking that her problem that Anna is pointing out is I used to play instead of I usually play, right? And then Rocio, a third student, jumps in and says, ha ha, me too. Is it on Monday or at Monday? And so Rocio refocuses the problem back to prepositions, which was the initial problem. And then the teacher sends uh, also his message on WhatsApp and says, what, uh, well, you should know it. What's your opinion, girls? So these kinds of interactions on WhatsApp over the six months did lead to improved accuracy in the English of these students. Um, so this is a matter of autonomy. These students were able to send messages a different student each day. They were able to choose, make decisions about what topics they wanted to talk about. They had a say on the kinds of language and errors or problems or issues that they would focus on. There was great autonomy in this activity and there was great balance of form and meaning. But meaning is more complicated than we ever knew or thought. So let me show you an example from a, a journal, a teacher journal that one of my students who was a teacher in training many years ago uh, wrote. She was an ESL, English as a Second Language uh, teacher, and she wrote a story about a student who came to her and the, the interaction they had together. My teacher said, once I had a student who kept saying, I came from Korea. I tried to correct her grammar by saying, if you're originally from Korea, you should use present tense when you refer to it. So if we're asked, where are you from? Oftentimes we'll say, I'm from Spain. In my case, I'm from Spain, or I come from Spain. But I came from Spain, I came from Korea sounds a little bit off. So in the journal, my student continued. My student said, since I don't want to go back to Korea and identify myself with American, I'd rather say I came from Korea and wish to be an American one day. So my student teacher was very shocked at this response. Um, it turned out that this issue was not at, at all about using well or using incorrectly the past tense in English, right? In fact, I came from Korea is a wonderful use of the past tense. It puts a distance between the now of the speaker and when leaving Korea happened, and it shows this special identity project, life project that this student has. So what the example shows is that people want to use language so as to be seen, heard, and judged in desirable ways, in whatever desirable ways they decide in their social worlds. And so who we want to be in the world matters and what language we use and how we learn to use our new language in this way matters. And that's a matter of agency. So again, it's the ability to change our place in the project of language learning, despite known structural constraints. In this case, being from Korea, being an immigrant, wanting a new national identity for their future. So learning language is about learning to mean, yes, but meanings are social and personal, and they're also entangled who, with who we want to be in the world and how we want to be seen by others. And that is agency. So we must consider that in how we balance form and meaning. Let me move on to recommendation. Uh, the second recommendation, uh, supporting autonomy and agency through the use of authentic materials first, and then I'll move on to native speakers. So, Learning grammar is about learning to mean and meanings are social and personal. So if we only teach with sanitized materials, simplified sentence level, invented or scripted language, we strip meaning, social, personal, etc., out of the grammar. And so we can't balance form and meaning well if we don't use authentic materials, at least to some level in our teaching. Let's take the example of ordering a meal. Um, and let's assume we are working with our students on, on fast food ordering. Typically, in most textbooks, we will see that we think of social roles for an activity like this. And we say to one student, OK, you take the counter worker role. And we ask the other student, you are the customer. And now let's, let's talk and role play and learn how to order fast food in English or in whatever language we're teaching. 
But there is so much more going on always with language, right? We have social goals and framings in, in the sense of Goffman. So for example, while ordering a meal, we may be thinking of our allergies and being nervous trying to make sure we don't order something to which we are allergic. Or we may be impatient thinking that the movie we need to go after the ordering of the meal and after eating the meal is gonna start soon. Or we are suddenly outraged thinking, how come are they charging me extra for the rice or for the uh, ketchup or for the French fries, whatever. So these things, what happens is then that we are trying to or want to express anxiety or implore someone to hurry or articulate disapproval at the same time as we are doing just the transactional uh, ordering of the meal. So that's language and that's authentic. And so we need the authentic materials and we need the authentic processes with, um, for engaging with those materials in an authentic way. Eventually, this is what a, a C2, a superior proficiency uh, speaker of a language should be able to do, all of it, not just ordering the meal, but all of it. Um, still, I do say here, it's good to use authentic materials for these reasons. It enhances the meaning and the personal connection and the complexity of the language we are learning. But does authentic mean created by and for native speakers. The, this comes to the second part of my recommendation, support autonomy and agency by questioning the native speaker myth. So let me explain what I mean by this. Do we need to view English learning or language learning, any kind of language learning as a ladder to native speaker perfection? As teachers or as students, do we need to adopt this very common way of thinking of the goal of language learning, native speaker perfection? Well, I would argue that this is problematic because it, needs, uh, it leads to a lot of linguistic insecurity. So have you ever noticed how much linguistic insecurity bilinguals feel? This is a quote by a famous uh, bilingual researcher, uh, Grosjean, and he says, many bilinguals have a tendency to evaluate their language competencies as inadequate. Some criticize their mastery of language skills. Others strive their hardest to reach monolingual norms. Others still hide their knowledge of their weaker language. And most simply do not perceive themselves as being bilingual, even though they use two or more languages regularly. And if I asked you in the audience, are you bilingual? Do you consider bilingual? Raise your hand if you do. I bet many of you would not raise your hand, even though you are bilingual, so you are using English plus other things, right? I'm seeing some participants raising hands in the, I think it's the chat, I'm not sure what it is, but I'm very glad to see hands up. Um, if you didn't raise your hand or if you hesitate to raise your hand, I think it's because you have an idea of what bilingual or multilingual means that is different from the idea that I have and that I'm trying to um, offer here. Not necessarily from birth. So you don't need to have been born to two or more languages in your family or from birth or from a very early age. Not native-like or passing for a native. You don't need to be speaking in a way that other people don't know. You have other languages not even perfectly equally proficient in all your languages, simply functionally able to use more than one language for your own purposes in life, whatever those purposes are. If you can say yes to that, we should all be raising our hands and feeling good about it and about our multilingualism. So what happens is that when we do have confidence in our linguistic abilities and our multilingual identity, this affects willingness to communicate in the weaker language or the other language or the new language or English. As Subtirelu in 2014 shown in a study, he investigated international students in the United States, in a, in a university in the United States. And so he found that some students reported having lots of difficulty with communication with people in English on campus and they blamed it 100% on their non-nativeness, on their not so good English. 
Whereas other students, other international students, were telling similar stories of difficult communication. So they were pretty much going through the same problems in day-to-day, daily, face-to-face communication in English. And yet, when they were explaining these very unpleasant encounters, they would blame it 50-50 on themselves and their English and their non-nativeness, but the other 50 on the not-so-helpful interlocutor, whether the interlocutor was native or not also, right? And so think about it. Who's better off? It turns out that the people who were blaming it all on themselves 100% avoided further communication in English. They were trying to avoid getting into more difficult communication situations. Whereas the the students who were able to blame it, see the situation, the problem as a 50-50 issue, they did not avoid further use of English. And so these students, the 50-50 ones, they exhibited a lingua franca ideology. It's communication, so it's never just all my fault. It must be also that the other person didn't try hard enough, doesn't speak very good, doesn't explain very well, doesn't have any interest in me. And so because the lingua franca ideology supported more confidence and less avoidance of future encounters in English, it really is much better for language learning in the the long run. So we have to remember that all bilinguals and multilinguals frequently experience vulnerability because oftentimes they are positioned by others as a novice, a foreigner, an outside member, or a not capable speaker. They're often being told that their language is not good enough or not good enough yet. They need to study more, try harder, speak more, practice more. And some are being told that their ways with language and the ways of their families and their communities with that language are not appropriate. And implicit messages from teachers can aggravate the problem. So, for example, here, this is a bilingual um, a bilingual classroom uh, in, um, in southern United States. And the teacher and the students are interacting and they're discussing the word rubia, blonde, in a story. And the teacher says, ¿Qué quiere decir rubia? What does rubia mean? One of the students, uh, the students don't answer, but then the teacher takes up answering and says, huera. Nosotros generalmente decimos huera, pero la palabra correcta es rubia. Blonde, uh, so uh, rubia means blondie, but in a colloquial version, we usually say blondie, but the correct word is blonde. So this instills linguistic insecurity in the students thinking that their ways of speaking and the ways of speaking of their families and communities are not appropriate, are not okay. And native speakerism of this kind can backfire against uh, English as a foreign language teachers too, because many of us are non-native speakers of the languages that we teach. And for example, in this uh, study by Goto Butler, um, she studied more than 300 grade six Korean EFL students And what she found is that they could understand equally well a passage recorded by a US accented and a Korean accented teacher. But these very young um, students judged the US accented teacher more positively than the Korean accented one. So they understood equally well, but they were more positive towards the US accent. And so it's terrible if you think about it that linguicism, this kind of linguistic prejudice is possible already among children who are just 12 or 13 years old. So we have to be very careful with these ideologies. And often we language teachers have the choice to judge linguistic incompetence or multilingual flexibility. What are we witnessing in our students? What are we doing ourselves if if we are non-native speakers of the language we teach? Are we witnessing, experiencing linguistic incompetence, or are we just multilingually flexible in how we do things? We're not monolinguals, we are multilinguals. So what does multilingual success look like in, in the sense that I'm trying to promote here? Well, let me give you an example from many years ago, a study that I conducted with uh, students of Spanish in Hawaii in the United States. So this was completely a foreign language for them. And one of them explained to me Unless you're a native speaker, you're not going to be able to speak perfect. I mean, we're still, we're still English speakers, you know. 
because I mean, you want to say it correctly in Spanish, her foreign language, but I don't think you need to say it always correct. I think you can always get away with it or get along the idea in a basic way. Yeah, you want to say it correctly, but it'll come through repetition and going over more and more and being around people who speak correctly all the time. So what this student is doing is having a very realistic attitude towards native speaker perfection. Hey, we're not native speakers, we're never gonna be. Um, also, um, I don't know, I think you can always get the idea across, well, is that laziness, not trying hard to be accurate, or is it a realistic idea of how communication really works? It depends on the teachers, they may choose one or the other as, as their opinion of what's happening here. And then this student has a very interesting theory of how language learning proceeds. She says, you want to say it correctly, but it'll come through repetition and more and more practice and being around people who can speak well. Confidence that success is perfectly possible, a realistic attitude towards the time, the effort and the models that it takes to, to learn a language well. So I think as teachers, we have to help ourselves and our students out of native speakerism. And instead we need to help ourselves and them build linguistic confidence because they need to want to keep learning and keep using the language. And for that, they need to be proud of who they are in all their languages. And so once again, this is all about agency. It's about the ability to change our place in the project of language learning despite known structural constraints, like being, being put the label of a non-native speaker by the rest of the world, by our teachers, by, by our peers. So let me move to this third and last recommendation in the talk. Uh, put motivation always first, but I'm gonna say agency too, especially autonomy as well, but also agency. So when our students are motivated, everything works well. And all good teachers know this for sure. All researchers of motivation also know this. And we have wonderful, wonderful, uh, and very large body of research showing all kinds of important things about motivation to, to learn a language and how important it is. But beware, motivation doesn't always win. Autonomy is also necessary. So let me first talk about autonomy with regard to motivation. Here's again another example from a study published so many years ago in 1998. And this is Samorn, a Thai graduate student who was already 30 years old or older doing a degree in business in New Zealand, I think it was. And she was talking to the researcher about a writing teacher in a writing class that she was experiencing. And here's what Samorn said. At the first time, I think that my writing is good because friends always say that it's good. But my teachers say that I have to have a lot of writing because it's not so good. And at the first time I feel confident of my writing because I think that my grammar, my tense and my plural and verb use with plural and with singular is okay. But when the feedback come out, teacher doesn't look enough in that grammar. The grammar is not the most important thing for her so she checked in the coherence, introduction, in something else. And I haven't got good marks. So I think that I am poor in everything of writing. I think that my grammar is good, but I didn't get any comments that, oh, your grammar is good, but you still have to, you still have to correct about uh, something like this. But all the comments come from, uh, come that my writing is not so good. So I feel that everything is poor. I think that at least she should admire me some points. From that time, I discouraged a lot and I feel don't like writing. So we have a very demotivated student, Samorn. She is proud of her own grammar and she's been told by friends how good her grammar is. She was confident initially. But then she gets feedback from the teacher and it's a very good writing teacher, it seems. So the teacher is like, I'm not gonna talk about the grammar of this person or this writer. I'm just gonna focus on the coherence, on the composition, the rhetoric, the structure, right? But then Samorn is missing that acknowledgement that, oh, 
okay, we need to work on other things in your writing, but your grammar is pretty okay. Right? And so it's striking also because if we look at the grammar that Samorn is, Samor is showing us in this quote, perhaps her grammar is not that great, right? Not yet, right? But for her, it's a big accomplishment. And perhaps compared to many other peers who also are Thai English speakers, she is ahead of them. And also she may have put a lot of effort over many years of studying English. And so she may feel like her grammar has come a long way, right? So could someone have made her secret motivations and frustrations known to her teacher? Like, I feel you're not complimenting me on this and I don't understand why you're focusing only on this other thing. Could someone's teacher have been more proactive asking uh, someone about her secret motivations and frustrations with the class and with the writing feedback she was receiving? This is what we call agentic engagement. It's the degree to which students make their secret motivations public in class and known to teachers. And get, let me give you some examples. So if, if a student would tell the teacher, reading Shakespeare is nice, but I would prefer to watch the movie version. May we do that? That's a way of showing your secret desire to do something that is slightly different from the option that the teacher is giving you. Or have the courage to say, could we practice this language in a real setting and not just memorize note cards? Or the courage to say, may we work with a partner if, if the teacher is assigning like an individual writing activity, for example. Or um, interrupting the teacher to ask, could you show me how to do this? Could we, could we give an example? Could we have a little bit more time? These kinds of things. It takes a lot of courage for a student to, to intervene in the class in this way. So how do we support uh, this kind of agentic engagement uh, from students? We can ask regularly, what are you interested in? What do you want to learn about? If we ask, we will get many more answers. So perhaps someone, if she had been asked, she could have intimated that she was feeling really demotivated and bad. And we can think, we can reflect on our own teaching and take moments aside from our teaching to think, if you asked my students now what they, you know, how do they react to these uh, statements, what do you think they would react like? For example, my teacher is unresponsive to my opinions or responsive to my opinions, or my teacher is indifferent to how I feel versus my teacher is very interested in how I feel. So we gauge these things and we create more opportunities to ask them to tell us their secret desires and motivations we're raising agentic engagement, and that really boosts motivation as well. And this is about autonomy. This is about giving students more room to make decisions, to have a say in the direction of their language learning, the content of their classes, et cetera. But also, I think motivation doesn't always win, and we need to be aware of that because agency is also necessary, not just autonomy, but also agency. So as a reminder, agency is the ability to change our place in the project of language learning, despite known structural constraints. Let me give you an example. This comes from a study in the United States in a, in a two-way immersion bilingual school, Spanish English, and Chaparro, Sofia Chaparro, uh, did the study. And two of the participants were two little girls, Zoe and Larissa, who were seven year olds and they were both in the same class and they, she, uh, Sofia Chaparro observed them for 18 months. So she really got to know very, very well how they functioned and how the classroom functioned. And so once Zoe made some progress in her Spanish, she began peppering her English with as much Spanish as she knew. And Larissa also does the same thing because at home uh, she has Spanish, in school she has Spanish and English. So she's peppering uh, her Spanish with a lot of English. The teacher though interpreted Zoe's behavior as showing her progress in Spanish and Larissa's behavior as indicating that she needed help with her ad academic Spanish and probably with her academic English. So the same exact interpretation, peppering one language with the other was interpreted by the teachers as a good thing, a creative thing, a sign of progress for Zoe and a sign of worrisome, kind of like she's beginning to be confused. She's beginning to get behind. She's beginning to need 
remediation, extra help, extra support with her academic language in school. What's the difference? Well, Zoe's parents are white, middle class, and college educated, whereas Larissa's mother is a Latina working class immigrant new to the US school system and, and struggling to communi communicate with parents and to keep it together in the eyes of the uh, teachers, communicating with teachers and keeping it together in the eyes of the teachers. So this is what um, Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa called ratio linguistics. And it's the idea that the same ways of using language can receive very different evaluations based on who the speakers are. When the speakers have more privilege, however they use language is more positively evaluated. And when speakers have less privilege, they're more negatively evaluated in their language ways. And this is regardless of the objective practices and of the competence or the appropriateness that they may be showing us. It's a matter of peppering one language with the other is viewed as a great creative sign of progress and learning in one child and as a real problem and a sign of alarm and need of support for the other child. So we have to remember that learning a language is about others treating us like legitimate speakers and treating our learning, our multilingualism, our errors, our less than perfect performances as legitimate and good signs of progress and effort. And part of it is whether we sound it and we look it in the language that we're using in the eyes of others. And this is a matter of ideologies, how they're going to read, how we sound, and how, how we look with respect to the language that we're using is a matter of ideology. So let me give uh, two more examples, but these are with Arabic as a, uh, sorry, before that though, the sounding it and looking it has to do with the structural constraints, our place in the world. So the languages that we exhibit, do we own them? Are we legitimate speakers of them in the eyes of others? but also intersecting with race and ethnicity, class, occupation and wealth, religion, gender, age, sexual orientation, and any other social categories that matter in a particular society or community. So here's the example with Arabic, um, studying Arabic as, as a new language or an additional language. This was Mahmoud, a Palestine American heritage language student from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And the story that he told to the researcher was while visiting family in Palestine. And so he recalled, Mahmoud recalled, that his cousins took him to lunch in Ramallah and he was handed a menu and asked to order from it, but he could not read it because it was in Arabic. Uh, Mahmoud commented to the researcher that since he looks exactly like his cousins, people assume he knows Arabic. And he was very embarrassed when he could not read the menu. This incident was his reason for enrolling in modern standard Arabic courses at the university in, in Milwaukee. One might say that it's a great thing that he decided to take up the study of his heritage Arabic out of this little trauma, little encounter that uh, was traumatic to him or upsetting to him. But basically what Mahmoud told the researcher literally was that it is just too hard to look Arab and not to have Arabic proficiency. So he just gave up out of being told again and again, well, you don't speak Arabic, but you look like an Arab. Why don't you speak Arabic, right? So looking it, sounding it as packages that have to do with how others view us in, in, in our place in the world and with these constraints. The opposite case was uh, another study with Mark, who was a white American uh, Midwestern, who was a superior C2 rating in Arabic. He was super motivated, super good uh, speaker of Arabic, but this is how he speaks about it with the researcher. He gets huge compliments when Arabs will stare at me, confused. Simply stare and then say, this just doesn't add up. I see your face and features, but your tongue is Arabic. So sounding it, but not looking it, right? And then he even explains further that he thinks 
it is a backhanded compliment. So like a not real compliment, but a real problem when the native speakers tell him, oh my God, how can you speak so well? Look at him and how he can speak better than we can Arabic. And Mark thinks that what this really means is you will never know the language. It's ours. You are the other, an outsider, and your hair and eye color will always give you away. So again, sounding it and looking it needs to be the right way for the person evaluating us to consider us a legitimate speaker, regardless of our proficiency. There is a lot that goes into the judgment of whether we are or are not worth of owning the language, speaking the language, being considered proficient, legitimate speakers. So in this case, motivation is super entangled with the ability to change our place in the project of language learning, despite known structural constraints. Like in this case, the ethnicity of Mahmoud was Arab, the ethnicity of Mark was Caucasian white Anglo, who is allowed to speak Arabic and who is allowed not to speak Arabic was a source of strain for both of them and it can affect their motivation. So let me conclude um, by saying that I have spoken about three recommendations. We do want to balance form with meaning. We want to use authentic materials, but rethink their roles and also rethink native speakers as models. And we absolutely need to boost motivation in our learning and teaching. And we need to think about these three classic areas of good language teaching and learning through the lenses of autonomy and agency. If we think about it through those lenses, then there are several things that one needs to keep in mind. Learning language is about learning to mean and meanings are social and personal. And they're also entangled who, with who we want to be in the world as others see us, and that's a matter of agency. People want to use language so as to be seen, heard, and judged in desirable, desirable ways in their social worlds. And learning a language is about others treating us like legitimate speakers, others telling us that we sound it and we look it and it's okay. But oftentimes they will tell us that we don't sound it or that we don't look it. And there will be ideologies, especially of racio-linguistic ideologies that they will employ to judge us. So for students to want to keep learning and using English or any other language, they need to feel proud of who they are in all their languages. And this is a matter of linguistic confidence and multilingual view of success. They need to feel they have a say over their learning. And this is a matter of autonomy. And they need to see possibilities to change their English learning projects, their language learning projects for the better, despite well-known structural constraints. And this is a matter of agency. So I've encouraged you all, yes, to balance form with meaning and keep language full of meaning, personal and with choice. And yes, to put motivation first, creating conditions for agentic engagement of students and for ways in which we can help them nurture agency. Uh, but also a big message that I want to put forth is that we need to support the linguistic confidence of our students by exposing them to authentic rich materials, by helping them question native speakerism and by helping them develop multilingual notions of success. Thank you very much. And um, I'm very pleased to be here and I hope we have a good interaction with questions and answers now. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Lourdes Ortega. Este, ha sido muy, muy interesante lo que, nos ha, lo que nos ha comentado. Tengo, los que nos ha expuesto, tengo aquí un comentario de Diana Portillo, quien nos comenta. Adela. Nos dice que, the problem, ¿sí? ¿Te puedo, te puedo interrumpir y pedirte que no hagamos claro que sí. screen option, like sharing screen? But yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that way we can see more faces and I think that's a, a little bit nicer. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Este, bueno, el comentario va, eh, dice, the problem in Mexico is, is if you don't have a C1 or a C2 level, we are not considered bilingual. I've taught English here for so long and I sometimes feel insecure about the use of English. Es, 
I, I mean, what can you tell us about this? This is exactly the problem. I know for a fact that we all feel on and off in different contexts, in different, with different interlocutors, we have this linguistic confidence that shakes us. Um, so I'm not saying that it's, it doesn't exist or it shouldn't. I am saying it exists. It's very widespread. It's widespread among teachers. It's widespread among uh, students. And it's one of the worst problems that we have for motivating students, for teaching language well, and for increasing autonomy and agency. So let's fight it. And we start by fighting it in our own back backyard. Let's try to convince ourselves that yes, we are multilingual and we are competent, even without the C2. But I do understand that the, the structural constraint is that the government, our boss, the parents of our students want us to have the C2 in hand. Yeah, I think you're right. It's <laughs> a problem everywhere, I think, no? Actually, I think there have been some studies about teachers' identity and how they have developed. It's, yeah. it's also a question of us, no? That we should be confident and we should not struggle with that, I guess. It's, a, okay. it's an injustice. It's an injustice. And so for injustices, the first thing is recognizing them. The second thing is not uh, blaming ourselves for the injustice. And the third one is resisting it and trying to fight against it. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, Gabriela Casillas Navarro, which is, I think it's a very interesting question. She says, is agency teachable? Agency is teachable. You know, I feel it is. I think uh, the, big, uh, the big demand on teachers is to diagnose, to detect when we have students with low agency, students who are demoralized, they think there's nothing they can do anymore to turn around and make their English language learning, their language learning better, more agenti. So diagnosing it by the teacher is the big challenge. If we catch a student who is demoralized for low, for, uh, and the reason is low agency, I think as good teachers know how to work with that. See, if we can work to motivate our students more, I think we can also work to make our students uh, boost up their agency, their sense of agency. So uh, we could say that agency and motivation are linked. So we have to work them together. That's right? Am I understanding correctly? Yes, I think uh, agency, uh, autonomy boosts motivation, agency boosts motivation. So. If we work on autonomy and, and uh, agency, we can also impact motivation well. Yeah. So we can see them like a system, right? That they are working in a system that one boosts the other and they work together like in a right. triangle probably. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, remember theories of motivation sometimes are very confined to say the ideal self. Uh, work with your students so that they can imagine an ideal self, right? But if you think of agency, then you're seeing the connections between your student and their place in the world and the kinds of judgments they're receiving from the world. And that's a bigger problem than just asking them to think positively of themselves, right? So we have more tools as teachers to work with our students if we understand agency beyond motivation. Yes, I think like you have mentioned something very interesting in the sense that we should look at our student in his environment, in what all the factors that can interact and that can motivate or demotivate or boost the agency or the contrary, right? Because right. it's not only the teacher, but his home, the social environment, the beliefs that people have about them. Yeah. Okay, I have another comment. I'm going to, it's in English. I have problems with switching. Uh, it's been reassuring to hear that we tend to underestimate our level and proficiency, and we really should not. This comes from Maria Guadalupe Nevebrito. And, well, I think well, I, every, everyone is, is agreeing, and also Guillermina tell us, are, uh, tell us that very interesting. We have to face idiosyncrasy and identity, and we have to fight against machismo. Yeah, well, that's another issue, right? Uh, yes, it, it's not. It's related, I think. We have to fight against all the isms that can get in the way of happy language learning and happy English learning. 
So in some contexts and in some classrooms and for some students and teachers, it could be machism, machismo, um, uh, sexism, the opposite, sexism, right, of any kind. Um, but it could be, as I said, when I showed the social categories that matter in every community or every society, they could be different from society to society, but those constrain our place in the world, the places we can take in the world. And so machismo can be a source of problem for language learning. And the same can be said of racism, ageism. Ageism is a big one. There are many people who want to learn English or another language. And they say they're not even going to try because they're too old already for that. That's ageism. That's a huge problem for language learning. So yeah, I'm all for identifying isms that are keeping our students behind and then try to address them in the classroom. Okay, Gloria Ronson comments also, the main issue, the main issue are the models is still promoted in many training courses and published materials. It is also a good time to reflect on our own understanding of language and what we take to classes or include in our self-access centers material, for instance. Very much so. I mean, the Weta example, Weta uh, Rubia example is a good example for that, right? What do we include in our materials for self-access? And do we give an opportunity for our students to see this kind of language that is very real and it happens all the time in the world? So they will encounter it. Do we give them an opportunity to actually normalize it and to feel like that's not inappropriate or that's not wrong or that's not you know, uh, bad language. That's how people talk about uh, Rubia in, in some context, period, right? Yep. Some people say Wera, some people say um, Rubia, just like some people say cabs and some people say taxis. And we, we don't attach any stigma to that, right? Taxis and cabs, equally good. It's just, it happens to be two different geographies doing that, right? But when it's different social strata doing something with language, we are happy as teachers, this is our expertise. We're happy to say, that's non-standard. That's not gonna get you, um, you know, doors are not gonna open for you if you use Weta instead of Rubia. Uh, if you interview for a job. So that's okay to, to discuss that for me is very useful. However, to tell the student that's not how we say it and that's not the correct way of saying it, that is a different way of framing it. And the way of framing it there is it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it's a different social stratum using that choice. Yeah, you're right. Never thought about that. Yeah, I know you have me. Food for thought. Maria Elena Solares asks, how do, you, how do international examination offices cope with the problem we are talking about? C2 meaning L2 proficiency, do they actually focus on the students being only functionally proficient? Actually, it's, uh, we are seeing a lot of language assessment uh, specialists take up this challenge. So we have a whole movement in uh, language assessment of uh, testers, scholars, who are designing tests that can be used as lingua franca English examinations. And they're trying to figure out what it means to be really competent without saying that it's a C2 like the native speaker does, right? So um, if I can order my fast food and at the same time be able to express anxiety that I'm gonna be late for my movie uh, or anxiety that my allergies are, you know, I'm gonna mess up in my order for my allergies and then I'm hurried and impatient because I need to go to the movie and then I'm outraged because you're charging me for the ketchup and you want to charge me extra. If I am able to do all of that in my interaction, ordering the food and be read as impatient, anxious and outraged and also get my food, that's a C2. And that how I do it is less important because native speakers will also do it in very different ways. Language is so much more open-ended than the assessments and the tests um, have it to be. However, I have to say next time for a plenary speaker do invite someone who is a language assessment person working on lingua franca um, measurements of competence because they're doing very interesting work. 
Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, Magdalena Vilapardo comments, uh, working with native speakers has made me led to a degree of thought and self-consciousness, question my identity as an English teacher. She also says agency is closely interwined with students' beliefs, interests, and purposes, and thus with identity as they enact their identity, responding to contextual conditions. And I will just say, I completely agree. <laughs> Um, identity would be another word that I could have used a lot. Um, I, I left it as sense of agency in view of our place in the world and the constraints that we know our place in the world can trigger structural constraints, but identity is all about that, right? So yeah, yes. non-native non speakers. And so I always tell my, uh, I, I tell two things to my students who are training to be teachers. One is if you can teach a language that is not your own and a language that is your own. So if you can change hats and be a native speaking teacher of a language and a non-native speaking teacher of another language for a little period or for some part in your life, you'll get so much more confidence as a teacher from having had the two hats. So you're not trapped in one or the other identity, but you know that it's contextual and that is you know, we're always native speakers of something and non-native speakers of something else, and we can be teachers of both. So I always say, tell my students that. Okay, thank you very much. A question from Ma Maria Teresa Mayen Estebaran. Does agency have to do with assertiveness to a certain extent? Assertiveness? Hmm. I think it has to do with being brave. Um, but I think it depends on the style and personality. Some people will do it with more assertive, you know, signs. So interrupting a teacher to ask like, oh, could we do it in purse instead of individually? That takes a lot of, um, como se llama en, en inglés? Um, ay, como mucha valentía. You have to have so much, be so brave in the moment to interrupt the teacher. You have to be very valiente, right? But do you do it with a big smile? I mean, I've had, I, I've had students who have actually interrupted me and suggested something very different from what I had in my mind to be the plan. And they did it with such grace and timidness. And they were like, just kind of, oh, but. Oh. So they felt brave enough to do it, but their style was not assertive at all. But I was able to hear them and then modify my plan. So for some people, it will mean assertive, but for other people, it may not need to. Okay, Atenas Garcia Gámez Gámez says, how can we resist, react, or intercede in our work environments when native speakerism comes from our colleagues and superiors? Yes. Ooh. I'm, st I'm still struggling with how to deal with that. I am a non-native speaker of English in an English speaking world. And it's not just, I don't teach languages anymore. I'm a, a professor. So I just teach my classes, mentor my students. And, but it's a big machinery of a university, right? So I always struggle thinking, what do I do? Because these are moments of indignities. When we, it, so it's microaggressions, it's called, and there's, research on these uh, with relation to language and native speakerism or with relation to race and ethnicity or with relation to sex and sexism and machism. Whatever it is, it's on the fly one-on-one -on -one contextual experiences where this feeling of um, lack of confidence arises. And we, we know it's because of something the other person is doing or saying or how they're interacting with us that has to do with say, you're not a native speaker of this language. So how do we respond to that? So that cumulatively over a long time, we're able to fight it off, to call our colleagues on it or our boss on it so that we can um, affect some uh, systematic structural change. I'm not sure. Um, because you also have to be very cautious with how much power you, how much power you have, and how much you have to keep yourself safe. So confrontational uh, reactions. I've had some of them. You know, I, I get very angry, so then I, I'm confrontational. Other times I, I'm just silent and I turn away. Other times 
I go and I write a letter, I go and I try to change a rule. Um, so it's very important to protect ourselves, to feel safe. But at the same time, if we don't try to do anything at all, that in the long run erodes our own capacity to be happy professionals of, of language education. Oh, okay, thank you. We have still a lot of comments. Well, congratulations from uh, Claudia Garcia Avila, Anneli Mendoza, Claudia Gar Garcia Moreno Avila says, I just love your suggestion of fighting isms that act as constraints and discourage our students are probably for ourselves. Such an enriching session. Thank you so much, capital letters. And so does uh, Anneli Mendoza says, it's been a very interesting plenary session. We have some other comments that I will, we'll, we will close the plenary like this. And um, which says that Laura Surutusa, and accepting, uh, it says, agency capacities are learned at home. Trusting in oneself is essential. So our chance to let the students see themselves with a different eye. And accepting feedback is all the difference in their learning experience and our teaching experience. Yeah, accepting feedback, yes, but we don't need to accept all feedback uh, if it hurts us. So Samorn, okay. Samorn was right not to feel okay. And I wish she could have told her teacher how she felt. Okay, uh, more, more congratulations. Malena Solares says, thank you very much for your insightful talk. talk. Always welcome in Mexico. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctora. Damos con esto la, el final de la sesión y en, nos, nos lo invitamos a que se queden para lo que es la clausura y unos avisos. Gracias. Muchas gracias a todos y encantada y muchas gracias por los comentarios y las uh, preguntas también. Les agradecemos a la maestra Delia Peña y a nuestra plenarista Lourdes Ortega por esta magnífica presentación y esta discusión tan enriquecida con la participación de todos. Eh, a continuación, vamos a dar solamente un par de avisos. Eh, les comentamos que en el micrositio que tienen acceso todos, van a encontrar posteriormente los videos de las sesiones que se han hecho y se han realizado durante esta, este congreso. Y que además les pedimos a todos los asistentes que eh, nos den su opinión sobre este congreso eh, en un Padlet que les van a compartir en el chat para que podamos tener eh, sus comentarios y podamos mejorar en las siguientes emisiones y esto sea un, una experiencia mucho más enriquecida. Suscríbanse también al canal de ILA. 2021 y al canal de eventos en Ana. Tenemos nuestras redes en Facebook para que nos sigan y estén al tanto de los eventos que se van a seguir generando. Muchas gracias y permanezcan por favor en sala unos momentos más. Vamos a iniciar la clausura. Producción, por favor, que tenemos la grabación. Gracias.
Buenas tardes a todos y todas. La Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México les da la más cordial bienvenida a la ceremonia de clausura del Congreso de la Asociación de Estudio Independiente con el tema del desarrollo de la autonomía en el aprendizaje de lenguas 2021. Agradecemos la presencia de los miembros del presidio. La doctora María del Carmen Contillo Escontria, directora de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción. La doctora Claudia Guadalupe García Yampayas, secretaria general de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción. El doctor Cristian Ludwig, coordinador de la línea de investigación de autonomía del estudiante de la Asociación Internacional de Profesores de Inglés. La doctora Giovanna Tassinari, directora del Centro de Autoacceso de la Universidad Libre de Berlín. La maestra Claire Taylor, presidenta de la Asociación Japonesa de Aprendizaje en Autoacceso. La doctora Leticia Adelina Ruiz Guerrero, responsable del Hub de Lenguas, Laboratorio de Autoacceso para el Aprendizaje de Lenguas de la ITESO, Universidad Jesuita de Guadalajara la maestra Paula Zulaica Gómez, directora del Departamento de Lenguas de la ITESO, Universidad Jesuita de Guadalajara, y la maestra María de la Paz Adelia Peña Clavel, coordinadora de la Mediateca de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción. Agradecemos también la presencia de todos los académicos que nos acompañan en esta sala de Zoom Webinar y en el canal de YouTube de la ENALT. Iniciamos nuestro programa con la presentación de la convocatoria para las memorias de este congreso a cargo del doctor Christian Ludwig, coordinador del Grupo de Investigación sobre Autonomía del Estudiante de la Asociación Internacional de Profesores de Inglés. Adelante, doctor. Ok, um, muchísimas gracias y buenas tardes. Voy a presentar um, la convocatoria. Um, so I'm going to um, briefly tell you a little bit, and I hope it's okay if I do that in English, and um, I think, yeah, maybe you can help. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce and tell you a little bit more about the conference proceedings, because um, we decided that it would be nice to um, publish some of the, the papers that, that have been presented throughout the conference um, in an edited volume, which will be published um, by um, Kentlin and Minard. So, and um, I think the, the call for papers is already open. And um, do we have the link? Are they, uh, maybe we can post it in the chat um, and you will find all the information um, there. And we, we're, of course, looking forward to um, many interesting contributions. And um, the focus of the volume is learn autonomy in theory and practice. And um, hopefully that will give most if not all of you um, the opportunity to um, publish your work and also make it available to um, a larger audience so um, thank you very much so and we're of course looking forward to the editors so I'm, I'm one of them um, but we are four editors and we're all looking forward to um, continuing this exciting project and um, yeah, show the world what, what all of you are doing thank you very much Thank you. Yes, we have also sent the email to all the plenarists and speakers, so they will have it in their email as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed. And um, yeah, that was it for me. A continuación, la maestra Paula Zulaica Gómez, directora del Departamento de Lenguas del ITESO, Universidad Jesuita de Guadalajara, nos dirigirá algunas palabras. Muchas gracias. Quiero agradecer muy encarecidamente la invitación de la UNAM y de la INALT en, en particular para colaborar en este Congreso de ILA 2021. Ha traído muchas satisfacciones para el ITESO, Universidad Jesuita de Guadalajara, para su Departamento de Lenguas y para todos sus miembros. Agradezco personalmente a la doctora María del Carmen Contillosh, a la doctora Claudia Guadalupe García, al doctor Cristian Ludwig, a la doctora Giovanna Tassinari, a la maestra Claire Taylor y a la maestra Adelia Peña. Sin duda, este congreso ha sido un éxito por todo su trabajo y hemos aprendido mucho de ustedes en la forma tan profesional, 
en el que han hecho un evento de esta magnitud y en esta modalidad posible. También quiero agradecer a mis colegas del ITESO que han trabajado incansablemente, tanto adelante como detrás de bambalinas. A la doctora Adelina Ruiz Guerrero, nuestra gurú de la autonomía. Además, a todo el equipo que participó en la producción. Ileana Rivas, Guillermina Arias, Lilia Córdoba, Esther Villaseñor, Gabriela Solórzano, Pamela Sigala, Sara Ramírez, Laura Arenas, Esperanza Espejo, Edgar Leandro, Sandra Serrano, Gabriela Sagasti, Claudia Martínez y Miguel Corral. Es un honor trabajar con ustedes. Gracias por dejar en alto el nombre del ITESO. Y finalmente, muchas gracias a todo el público asistente. Muchas gracias, maestra. Enseguida, la maestra Adelia Peña Clavel, coordinadora de la Mediateca de la ENALT, compartirá algunas reflexiones y datos sobre este congreso. Muchas gracias, Víctor. Y buenas tardes, doctora María Carmen Contillo Quescontria, directora de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción. Doctora Claudia Guadalupe García Yampaya, secretaria general de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción. Doctor Cristian Dutti, coordinador de la línea de investigación de autonomía del estudiante de la Asociación Internacional de Profesores de Inglés, Ayatefo. Doctora Giovanna Tassinari, directora del Centro de Autoacceso de la Universidad Libre de Berlín. Maestra Claire Taylor, presidenta de la Asociación Japonesa de Aprendizaje Auto de Autoacceso. Doctora Leticia Delina Ruiz Guerrero, responsable del Club de Lenguas de ITESO en Universidad Jesuita de Guadalajara. Maestra Paula Solaica Gómez, directora del Departamento de Lenguas de ITESO Universidad Jesuita de Guadalajara también. Este ha sido un congreso que inició, y público en general, perdón, este ha sido un congreso que inició hace un año con el teaser, con el teaser event exactamente que, que hoy hicimos con el, doctor, con el doctor David Little y cerramos este ciclo con seis plenarias y 60 actividades académicas en el programa. Sin duda, ha sido un largo camino que hemos disfrutado y que ahora podemos ver el producto de todo este esfuerzo. Iniciamos con nuestra una plenaria hablando sobre emociones, después sobre cómo podemos apoyar a nuestros estudiantes a seguir un proceso para el desarrollo de autonomía, motivándolos a crear comunidades de aprendizaje. Después nos dimos a la tarea de pensar y nos dimos cuenta que siempre estamos pensando, y al menos yo sigo pensando, pues después de escuchar sobre multilingüismo y agency, hay mucho que decir y mucho que aprender, y así como muchos retos que, que sobrellevar. Hemos reflexionado sobre el desarrollo de autonomía en diversos escenarios y compartido sobre nuevas prácticas en diversas partes del mundo, en nuestros centros de autoacceso y el aula, y en la enseñanza remota. Ahora compartiré con ustedes algunos de nuestros números como son los datos generales, con las asistencias a las sesiones fueron 1,260, tuvimos un promedio de asistencia de 24 asistentes por cada sesión, un total de equipos de producción de, de 7 y unos colaborados de 52 académicos de la ITESO y la UNAM. En el canal de YouTube hemos tenido 1,103 visitas y un promedio de 164. El registro de nuestro Facebook tuvo de 174 me gusta. Hemos tenido asistentes de 10 países, Alemania, Austria, China, Estados Unidos, Grecia, Japón, Vietnam, Reino Unido, Trinidad y Tobago y México como país anfitrión. Y tuvimos 16 instituciones internacionales y 26 nacionales. Todo este gran trabajo no, sería, no hubiera sido posible agradeciendo el apoyo de la doctora María del Carmen Contillo, que es contria, y la doctora Claudia García Yampayas. Muchas gracias por apoyarme en todo esto y apoyar a todo el equipo. A Cristian y a Giovanna por apoyarnos con el TISA y la organización del comité académico de todo este evento. Adelina, muchas gracias por estar siempre ahí. Maestro Solau Cagrarme, muchas gracias por apoyarnos. Especial mención quiero hacer a cuatro pilares. Sin ellos este trabajo no hubiera sido, hubiera sido aplastante. Elizabeth, Rosario, Gaspar y Laura, muchísimas gracias. Mi reconocimiento a ustedes por este trabajo arduo desde hace dos años y que en este último mes fue de tiempo completo. Al Departamento de Cómputo por la transmisión del seminario y el increíble website y micrositio. Manuel Luis Osman Enrique, muchas gracias. Y a todos los que aparecen en esta lista, mil gracias. Finalmente, la doctora María del Carmen Contillo Escontria, directora de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción, procederá a hacer la clausura formal de las actividades académicas de este congreso. Adelante, doctora. Muchas gracias. Muy buenas tardes. Tengan todas y todos ustedes. 
distinguidos miembros del presidium, no los nombraré nuevamente, no se preocupen, es una larga lista. Queridos académicos y amigos, el tiempo pasa rápido. Pareciera que fue hace unos momentos que comenzábamos los trabajos de este congreso. Este evento ha tenido sin duda la calidad académica deseada y esperemos que haya llenado las expectativas de los participantes. Las plenarias, todas ellas magníficamente presentadas por académicas de excelencia, a quienes les agradecemos la generosidad al brindarnos sus conocimientos y compartirlos con nosotros. Fuimos partícipes también de una variedad de presentaciones, talleres, pechacuchas, que giraron en torno al tema central, el desarrollo de la autonomía del estudiante en el aprendizaje de lenguas. Estamos conscientes que representa un reto lograrlo. Podríamos continuar otros tantos días en el ciberespacio discutiendo y reflexionando sobre la mejor manera de lograrlo y qué pedagogía adoptar, seleccionando materiales, los más adecuados y todo lo necesario para iniciar y guiar al alumno en este camino hacia la autonomía y el aprendizaje independiente. Aprendimos, como ya lo dijo Adelia, desde las emociones hasta la literacidad digital, se habló de las experiencias negativas, el translenguaje, el multilingüismo, la, la importancia de la gentilidad y mucho, mucho más. Nos quedan muchos más temas en el tintero, no se preocupen, habrá tiempo en un futuro próximo para abordar nuevamente estas y otras más que seguramente tendremos que apuntar. La siguiente conferencia nos volverá a sorprender y mejor aún, nos volverá a unir para que juntos sigamos construyendo las mejores condiciones y mejores escenarios de aprendizaje para nuestros estudiantes. No podríamos finalizar sin dejar de agradecer a todas y todos los que han hecho posible este evento, como ya vieron es una larga, larga lista. Mi profundo agradecimiento a quienes ayudaron y colaboraron a nuestra querida ITESO por su, por su gran ímpetu y colaboración y a ese gran equipo. A, son todos unos profesionales. Muchas felicidades. A, a Tefl, ¿no? a Ludwig por su, por su muy buen español, que había, hay que felicitarlo y que esperemos pronto pueda visitar México. A nuestra querida, querida Adelia Peña, por coordinar de manera excelente e impecablemente este magnífico evento y a todo el equipo de académicos, técnicos académicos de mediateca, de cómputo, los ingenieros, los diseñadores, todo sería, ustedes ya vieron esa lista tan larga, pero que de verdad con todo el corazón y entrega desde la ENAL colaboraron para que esto fuera un éxito. Al área de comunicación social también no se nos olvide, todos, todos con la, con la camiseta puesta. Pues eh, gracias a, a ustedes y a los participantes que nos acompañaron y a los ponentes y a los plenaristas, este evento ha sido todo un éxito y lo que demuestra es que con este gran esfuerzo podemos hacer y lograr lo que nosotros queramos. No nos digamos adiós, sino hasta luego. Cuídense mucho. Y siendo entonces las 4 de la tarde con 28 minutos de la Ciudad de México, declaro clausurados los trabajos de este Independent Learning Conference 2021. Mucha suerte, mucho éxito. Síganse cuidando para podernos ver muy pronto. A nombre de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México y de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción, tengan muy buena tarde, noche o mañana, depending on where you are and how you are. Thank you very much to all the attendees, the plenarists, and all the people who collaborated with us for this event. Thank you, Adelia. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the lovers of self-independent learning. And to all those who are in charge of self-access centers, we have transformed and we will continue transforming ourselves and our learners. Thank you very much. Goodbye.
Thank you, everybody. Yes, Agradecemos a todos su presencia y pedimos a todos los miembros de los equipos de producción, por favor, que enciendan sus cámaras. Les decimos hasta luego y nos vemos en la próxima emisión de ILA 2023. Bravo a todos. Thank you, Ludwig, for being here. Thank you, Adelina, and everybody. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes. Por favor, saquemos fotografías. Qué gusto verlos a todos. Muchas gracias. Sí, igualmente. Muchísimas gracias, Paula. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Adelina. Creo que no, no alcanzaría a mencionarlos a todos. Muchísimas Ajá. gracias. Gracias, Adelia. A dormir y a comer, oigan. Sí. Gracias, chicos de servicio. <risa> Vayan a, a los chicos algo. de servicio social, por favor. Muchísimas a gracias, chicos. A Pepe, a después gracias. a dormir, ¿verdad? ¿eh? Gracias. Gracias. A la a fiesta, ah, no. Fiesta. Sí. Uh, fiesta virtual. Una, una, es una fiesta muy, muy tarde. Los restaurantes y bares que a las 11. Son las mejores, son las mejores no, no, a estas no. horas. Pero podemos ir a casa de alguien. Ya estamos vacunados.